Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Pete Musto and Brian Lynn. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, Denmark eased its coronavirus restrictions on Wednesday by reopening schools and daycare centers. But thousands of parents kept their children at home because of concerns about a second wave of coronavirus infections. As the rate of new cases falls, the government's decision to reopen schools has led to a debate over balancing the economy and the safety of children. I won't be sending my children off no matter what, said Sandra Anderson. She is the founder of a Facebook group called My Kid Is Not Going To Be A Guinea Pig. It has more than 40,000 followers. Anderson is the mother of two girls aged five and nine. I think a lot of parents are thinking, why should my little child go outside first, she said. The coronavirus has infected more than 6,600 people across the country. 300 of them have died as a result of COVID-19, the disease caused by the virus. Denmark has told citizens to stay safe at home for the past month. The government also ordered stores, restaurants, and movie theaters to close. On Wednesday, Prime Minister Meta Fredriksson defended the decision to reopen schools. Fredriksson said she had acted on the advice of health officials. She also said reopening the schools would let parents return to work and get the economy going again. Christian Weisse is a scientist at the Department of Infectious Diseases at Aarhus University. Weisse said he understood people's worries because we've spent a month trying to avoid contact. But he added that new infections would not be a problem for children because few fall ill and those who do won't get very sick. He told Danes to look at neighboring Sweden, which has kept schools open without a big rise in infections. Children, he added, do not seem to be much of a carrier of the infection. Teachers have been told to keep social distancing in place between children. Social or physical distancing means keeping space between yourself and other people. Thousands of Danish mothers have joined an online group called Momster. Its founder, Esme Emma Suchu, said most mothers do not believe government officials have things under control. She said, Suddenly, these moms feel like they just have to throw their kids to the front line, and I think their reaction is, don't mess with our kids. An American research company says a dam in China on the Mekong River held back water while countries farther down the river needed water last year. U.S. research company Eyes on Earth released its findings in a report. 
It said China was not suffering from a lack of rain at the time. China's government rejected the findings. It said there was low rainfall over its territory during last year's monsoon season. Eyes on Earth Incorporated researches international water issues. Its study was financed by the U.S. government. The study could affect discussions between China and other countries on the Mekong River. The river supports 60 million people living on or near it. The Mekong runs for about 4,350 kilometers through China, Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Last year's drought saw the lower Mekong at its lowest levels in more than 50 years. The lack of water hurt farmers and fishermen economically. If Chinese officials are saying they did not make the drought worse for other countries, the information found does not support that position, said Alan Bazist. He is the president of Eyes on Earth. The Upper Mekong flows through China's Yunnan province. Satellite measurements of the area's ground wetness in 2019 suggest it had a small increase in rain and snow during that year. Satellites also measured areas downstream from China along the border of Thailand and Laos. Water levels there were at times up to three meters lower than they should have been, the group said in the study. That suggests China was not letting the water out during the wet season, Bazist said. China has 11 dams on the upper Mekong River. No one outside of China really knows the effects that these dams have on the flow of water. China has not released information about how much water the dams are using to fill their reservoirs. Eyes on Earth said those reservoirs can hold more than 47 billion cubic meters of water. China does not have water treaties with the lower Mekong countries, but it has promised to work with other countries on the river to find the cause of last year's drought. The United States says China controls the river. Last year, in Bangkok, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the drought was caused by China's decision to shut off water upstream. Starting in 2012, when the larger of China's upper Mekong dams opened, the flow of water to other countries changed. The explanation that China's dam building on the Lanzang River is causing downstream droughts is unreasonable, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs said in a statement to Reuters. It calls the river the Lanzang its Chinese name. I'm Pete Musto. Apple and Google have teamed up to launch a mobile phone tool to follow the contacts of people infected with coronavirus. The technology is a form of contact tracing, a method used to identify people who may have had contact with infected individuals in an attempt to prevent additional spread of disease. Health officials say the method is an effective way to help slow the spread of highly contagious viruses. The current coronavirus, which is affecting much of the world, causes the disease COVID-19. 
Many carriers of the virus do not know they have it because they have no immediate signs of illness. They could be spreading the virus unknowingly. Contact tracing is a way to identify others who may have been infected. The two companies say Bluetooth wireless technology will permit devices near each other to exchange information. A record of the Bluetooth signals between devices would be created. If a device user becomes infected with the virus and agrees to share that information, the record could be used to inform other people that the user could have infected. Apple and Google say they first plan to release app versions of the technology for Android and Apple devices by mid-May. Over the next several months, they plan to build the tracking technology directly into the device operating systems. Numerous technology companies and organizations have been seeking to develop tools to help fight COVID-19. Some of the existing tools use data from mobile devices to measure and record population movements. Health and government officials have called for such technology to help fight the current crisis. Government-backed apps have already been launched in some countries, including Singapore, South Korea, India, and China. The technology is also being developed in Britain, Germany, and Italy. Israel's health ministry released a contact tracing app in late March. The app came after the Israeli government confirmed that the country's security service had started collecting data from citizens' phones to trace the movements of virus patients. In a joint statement, Apple and Google said, there has never been a more important moment to work together to solve one of the world's most pressing problems. The companies also said they would be cooperating with developers, governments, and public health providers to use the power of technology to help countries around the world slow the spread of COVID-19 and accelerate the return of everyday life. Major technology companies, including Google and Facebook, have been criticized in recent years for not protecting user privacy. In some cases, companies have been accused of secretly selling user data. In the past, Apple chief Tim Cook has criticized Facebook and Google for putting profits ahead of user privacy. In announcing the new system, Apple and Google said its developers had built in strong protections around user privacy. The companies said the technology would not identify personal information or record user movements. It is designed to only capture data about when users' phones have been near each other. Data will not be kept on company servers, Apple and Google added. The two companies also said they would openly publish information about their work for others to examine. Pam Dixon is director of the not-for-profit World Privacy Forum. She told the Associated Press that after discussing the new system with a top Apple official, she is convinced that people's privacy will be protected. I think they've taken care of some of the really big problems, she said.
Dixon noted that the companies said they are able to turn off the system when it is no longer needed. The government is not going to have identity information of those testing positive. I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. We tell the story of the 38th President of the United States. Mr. Chief Justice, my dear friends, my fellow Americans, the oath that I have taken is the same oath that was taken by George Washington and by every president under the Constitution. But I assume the presidency under extraordinary circumstances never before experienced by Americans. Gerald Ford was sworn into office on August 9, 1974. Ford was vice president to Richard Nixon, who had announced the day before that he would resign. If Nixon had not resigned, he might have been removed from office. Congress had been moving to charge him with corruption in the Watergate case. At his swearing-in ceremony, the new president spoke about the nation's future. My fellow Americans, our long national nightmare is over. Our Constitution works. Our great republic is a government of laws and not of men. Here, the people rule. He went on to say, As we bind up the internal wounds of Watergate, more painful and more poisonous than those of foreign wars, let us restore the golden rule to our political process and let brotherly love purge our hearts of suspicion and of hate. Gerald Ford became the only leader in American history to have served both as vice president and president without being elected. Richard Nixon chose him as vice president in October 1973. That was when Nixon's former vice president, Spiro Agnew, resigned because of criminal charges that he failed to pay his taxes. When Nixon himself resigned, Ford became president. Ford was a longtime congressman from the state of Michigan. He was well liked by his congressional colleagues. His education was in economics and political science at the University of Michigan. Then he attended Yale Law School. During World War II, he served as a naval officer in the Pacific. After the war, Ford entered politics. He was a member of the Republican Party. He was first elected to the House of Representatives in 1948. He won re-election 12 times. Republicans in the House elected him the minority leader during the administration of Democratic President Lyndon Johnson. Ford was still minority leader when Richard Nixon, a fellow Republican, was elected president in 1968. In his leadership position, Ford helped win approval of a number of Nixon's proposals. He became known for his strong loyalty to the president. It was no surprise then when Nixon named Ford as vice president. Gerald Ford was an accidental president. He came to office in a sudden turn of events. Almost as suddenly, he had to decide what to do about the former president. After Nixon left office, he could have been charged with crimes for his part in covering up the events of Watergate. Instead, one month after Nixon resigned, President Ford settled the question. 
he pardoned Nixon for any crimes that he might have committed. The pardoning of Nixon made many Americans angry. Some believed he should have been put on trial. They thought he might have answered more questions about Watergate if he had not been pardoned. Ford said he pardoned Nixon in an effort to unite the country. For a while, though, the pardon only seemed to intensify the divisions. And I wondered whether anybody had brought to your attention the fact that the Constitution specifically states that even though somebody is impeached, that person shall nonetheless be liable to punishment according to law. In October 1974, President Ford appeared before a congressional hearing on the pardon. He gave a strong response to questioning by Democratic Representative Elizabeth Holtzman. Uh, Mrs. Holtzman, I was fully cognizant of uh, the fact that the president, uh, on resignation, uh, was accountable uh, for any criminal charges. Uh, but I would like to say that the reason I gave the pardon was not as to Mr. Nixon himself. I repeat, and I repeat with emphasis, the purpose of the pardon was to try and get the United States, the Congress, the President, and the American people focusing on the serious problems we have both at home and abroad. And I was absolutely convinced then, as I am now, that if we had had this series, an indictment, a trial, a conviction, and anything else that transpired after that, that the attention of the President, the Congress, and the American people would have been diverted from the problems that we have to solve. And that was the principal reason for my granting of the pardon. Anger about the pardon was still strong when President Ford made another controversial decision. He pardoned men who had illegally avoided military service in the Vietnam War. Most of them were not sent to prison. Instead, they were offered a chance to do work for their communities. Many of the men, however, did not accept the president's offer. Some stayed in Canada or other countries where they had fled to avoid the draft. President Ford received greater public support when he asked Congress to limit the activities of the nation's intelligence agencies. He hoped better control would prevent future administrations from abusing the constitutional rights of Americans as Nixon had done. On another issue, Ford, while serving as vice president, had described inflation as America's public enemy number one. He had supported several measures to fight it. As president, however, an economic recession forced him to cancel some of those measures. Inflation decreased during the recession, but unemployment increased. On foreign policy issues, Ford kept Henry Kissinger as Secretary of State. Kissinger had won much praise for his service to Richard Nixon, including in the opening of diplomatic ties with Communist China. But Kissinger had also received much criticism. Critics accused him of interfering with civil liberties in the name of national security. They also accused him of supporting the overthrow of the Marxist government of Salvador Allende in Chile. By the time Ford became president, the United States and the Soviet Union had taken steps to try to limit the spread of nuclear weapons. Nixon and Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev had signed two such agreements as part of the detente policy to ease Cold War tensions. Relations with China 
were also less tense than before. American policy in Southeast Asia, however, had failed. Involvement in the Vietnam War had officially ended the year before Gerald Ford became president. But fighting continued between South Vietnam and communist forces from the North. The peace agreement signed by the United States and North Vietnam in 1973 left South Vietnam to defend itself. By 1975, South Vietnamese forces were clearly in danger of defeat. President Ford tried to prevent a communist takeover. He asked Congress to approve $700 million in military aid for South Vietnam. Congress said no. The American people were tired of paying for the war. Saigon. The South Vietnamese capital fell to communist forces on April 30th, 1975. President Ford ordered the rescue of American citizens and South Vietnamese who had supported the American efforts. Few people who saw those struggling to escape Saigon will ever forget that day. Terrified Vietnamese were screaming for help at the American embassy. Everyone was pushing, trying to escape the city. Some held on to overloaded military helicopters as the aircraft tried to take off. As a signal to American citizens to prepare to leave, Armed Forces Radio had played the song White. Some were to go to an apartment building where a helicopter would pick them up from the roof. But other people also tried to get onto the helicopter, a scene captured in a famous news photo of the fall of Saigon. The former South Vietnamese capital was renamed Ho Chi Minh City. In the Middle East, Henry Kissinger led negotiations after the 1973 Arab-Israeli War. Israel agreed to give up some captured territory. In return, the United States promised not to recognize or deal with the Palestine Liberation Organization unless the PLO met certain conditions. In September 1975, Israel and Egypt signed an agreement that included permission for American civilians to act as observers along the ceasefire lines. Henry Kissinger was praised for his peacemaking efforts, though peace in the Middle East would remain a challenge for future administrations. At home, things seemed better as the presidential election campaign of 1976 began. That year marked the nation's 200th birthday. The United States was not fighting any wars. Unemployment remained high, but inflation had eased. Most importantly, Gerald Ford had led the country through the difficult period after Watergate. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.